Dr. Cuban will uh, introduce our next presenters. Welcome back, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Cuban. I teach in the electrical engineering area. And these two guys here made use of some of our spare parts and some of our new parts to do a really neat project and learn a lot about uh, drones and microcomputers, et cetera. So I'd like to introduce the men in black here, Richard Helmerich and Travis Brown. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to the presentation of our Aerial Topography Surveyor. Like stated, I am Richard Hummer. I'm Travis Brown. To get us started, surveying. It is simply the measurements of distances and angles to determine relative positions of existing points and determine the relative position of new points. To quote one of our sources, Surveying measurements must be made with precision to achieve a maximum of accuracy with a minimum expenditure of time and money. This is pretty much the underlying concept of our project, to create a tool that could save time and money for any kind of surveying company. Topography <coughs> maps are one of the tools used in surveying. They represent the elevation of the ground, and curvature of the terrain using 2D and can also be represented in a 3D format. Our goal was to create a simple surveying tool using uh, as little material as possible uh, because we wanted a cost-effective method of uh, surveying. For that, we decided to go with the GPS for uh, a lot of data points in terms of longitude, latitude, and also a distance sensor for a little bit of extra accuracy in uh, locating, locating what we wanted to scan. And to get all the data we collected and sort of into a survey, we needed uh, a 3D software. So that's also something we uh, were looking for at the beginning. And we wanted to mount it on an aerial vehicle like a quadcopter, uh, just so it can be versatile when it collects data as well. Here's a block diagram of what the design looks like. As you can see, the battery is giving power to the parallax board, and the GPS and infrared are also getting power, but they're sending back data. Then all that data comes over to the SD card, where uh, we then plug it into the computer, which uh, and put that into the 3D software. Now, the GPS, it really functions based off 24 active satellites, and then there's three extra ones just for backup. And the thing is with uh, locating uh, locating an object in terms of longitude and latitude, you only need three satellites, which is triangulation. But to get that extra precision, such as at altitude or height, uh, you need four, and that's trilateralization. And uh, using a combination of that, you can get various points like the longitude, latitude, altitude, and uh, other points of data just from uh, four satellites. This is our GPS, the CAM 7Q D block. It's uh, only a receiver, but its antenna is fairly precise with the most, uh, most data points that we'll show later. It doesn't require a lot of power, and it's uh, easy to integrate in terms of it's really small and it's uh, simple to program in terms of uh, it's programming. Here's our distance sensor. It's uh, the sharp it's infrared sensor. It has an infrared emitting diode and a position sensitive detector. Uh, its range was roughly 100 to 550 centimeters, which is uh, close to 3 to 18 feet, which is nice because, like I said, we want to put it on a quadcopter, so anywhere between head level to up to 18 feet sounds like an ideal for a quadcopter or some other aerial vehicle. There was some issues with the uh, readings at first with the distance sensor, but uh, we figured out that putting a capacitor, like a 100 microfarad capacitor, stabilized the readings uh, after that. For the distance sensor uh, to get the readings, it, take, it sends back analog signals, so you don't get a, a flat distance or voltage or anything. So what we did for that is we set up a range test and used a whiteboard and took five centimeter intervals to uh, get the analog reading which, thanks to the parallax board, turns it into a digital reading. So we had uh, nothing but digital reading, readings out of uh, each test. So we plotted 
those in Excel. And as you can see, the digital readings are on the left and the distance is on the bottom. And this is the trend it got, it gave. And as you can see, between 100 to 550 uh, centimeters, it does have a smooth curve. So that's where it's uh, distance is accurate. Other, otherwise, you go uh, below or past that, it's uh, pretty illegible to tell where the distance is measuring. And we've kind of flipped the axis here. Uh, the readings are on the bottom and the distance is on the left, but with that we were able to create a power, uh, power equation to uh, take the readings from the distance sensor and turn it in and plug it into the equation and get the distance it was measuring. The first board that we decided to use was given to us right offhand here at USI. It was the Intel Galileo project board. It has many features that we were that we really needed to incorporate in our design. A micro SD card for saving our data, our five volt pins, and our analog pins for our analog and digital pins for our sensors. While programming the Intel Galileo, we determined that one of the many core files used to program a GPS did not, was not supported by this. So a new program board had to be bought. The Parallax Propeller board, Activity Board was a, is made by the same company that made our GPS. Therefore, the programming was very similar. As you can, as shown here, it still has the micro SD card slot, our five volt pins, and our, and all of the, and also a breadboard that became very handy when it came to incorporating the 100 microfarad capacitor. The programming of the two boards was pretty different. Uh, the Intel Galileo ran on a program environment called Arduino, while the Parallax board focused on a C programming base, both of which have many attributes, but also troubles with programming. The Arduino board had a large community, is highly accept accepted by hobbyists, and there's a lot of troubleshooting that you can find with very little research. However, the debugger, or how you solve complicated problems was very limited and it became harder to to work around problems that we came across. The parallax board it programs in a C code. It has very simple to find errors. The community is also just as large and it also came with a very wide extensive library of programs to be able to implement. <coughs> the Distance sensor had to go through an A to B conversion, an audio to digital converter, just like, like stated before, to get our four digit numerical value. The number of satellites also had to be taken into place, so the, a simple if loop was changed in the GPS code to allow only to take readings from four satellites. And then, of course, all of it was saved on the SD card. Here's what the integration looks like on paper. And it's a bit like the block diagram, but uh, boxes and wires uh, connecting instead of just arrows. Uh, here's a, this gray little box is a the capacitor. And then the, each individual strand is a different wire in terms of uh, ground or voltage or data being sent back and forth. And here's what it looks like in the it's final integration form. The infrared sensor is actually on the outside of the box, so it can get that distance reading to the ground. And uh, it's all secure in the box pretty well because we want we wanted it to be protected physically in the quad copper in case it uh, fell or crashed in some anyway. There was a previous senior design a project where they designed and built a quad copter, and it's the one in the picture shown. Uh, there was an issue with one of the rotors not spinning uh, adequately, and well, we tried messing with the phases, the different, and we tried replacing the motor itself, and 
uh, we figured out that one of these, one of the little blue chips on the inside of the motor speed controller was malfunctioning. And by the time we figured out what the problem was, we realized it was too late to tear it apart and try to fix that specific feature and put it back together. So we realized that this specific quadcopter was no longer viable for our uh, initial test. Then a fellow student named Jackson Taylor uh, came to us and said he had a quadcopter he was willing to let us borrow for the project. This is it. The, what the quadcopter shown here is the DJI Phantom version 1. It lasts about 10 to 15 minutes, which is plenty of time for uh, any testing we wanted to do. And it, it turned out to be really nice, as, as you'll see later, in terms of orientation and being able to control it stay, uh, in terms of stability. And this is, as shown in the picture here, with the, it's what the integration looks like attached to the quadcopter if it's nice and snug underneath it. And the picture on the left, uh, it actually has duct tape wrapped around it so when it's in the air and it can stay in place as it moves left, right, back, forth, uh, and maybe even tilts. And we actually had Jackson Taylor, the owner of the quadcopter, pilot it because he had a little more experience than both of us. So we thought we'd get more stable readings thanks to him. In order to represent all of our data in a 3D format, we had to we had to come across a 3D <coughs> plotting uh, software. The Origin Pro 9.1 was able to take all of our data and then turn them into a uniform a uniform plot. It also did what it also implemented was called surface spinning, where it will project where future plots points will be to fill an entire graph and it was able to create a large surface from just a few points. So this is the graph from our trial one. It's, trial one was simply one of us holding up the box about head height, not moving in any way, to see, how, to see what kind of air we were going to get with our sensor. In the red box, you see there's a tiny pillar. This shows that the longitude and latitude did not change at all, while the altitude clearly has clearly differed between three meters. This is the graph from this is the uh, Excel spreadsheet from this trial. The longitude and latitude, just like in the graph, stayed pretty stable. However, the distance, the altitude, had a settling time. It decreased from 181 and then settled about 144 meters. Now that we knew that there was going to be a settling time, we were able to work around this. Then there was the distance sensor that was converted from our four-digit numeric value. And it only had an error of plus or minus 0.2 meters. This was pretty stable compared to the altitude meter that even after settling differed between a whole meter. Trial two was taking our sensor and then walking in a square over a flat piece of concrete. As you know, that would be, it would show that any kind of settling time would definitely come out in our graph. Just like in the first trial, it differed between a meter, either direction, giving a maximum of point of two meter difference. And even though it looks, it appears flat, it for such a small area to be different between two meters is pretty is pretty significant. The video shown here is the area we uh, were able to find a quad copter for readings in the USI quad. It was used for trials three and four. The only difference between the trials is trials four. They require this black box, but trial three was the area without the box. So this video is of trial four, but it's of the same area of the next two trials. It is the quadcopter and the distance sensors are already taking readings, and we were able to fly it and cover that small patch of area. And it might be hard to see, but Whenever it pivots, you can see that the bottom swings out a little bit, and that has been captured in our, in our future plots. But for the most part, the quadcopter did stay stable 
And it proved to be a viable concept if you're wanting to take readings of an area to make sure it gets complete, it gets perpendicular to the ground. This is our graph of trial three. As you see, the as can be shown, the area that we did take our measurements of was on a little bit of an incline. However, due to the settling time of the altitude meter and the errors that was in the altitude meter and the distance sensor, along with the projection uh, surface fitting of the surface of the origin pro, you can see that points were highly exaggerated in order to fit to the whole plot. This is how it, you get this large incline. <coughs> Trial four is of the video that you saw. And here is the black box, and here is the, the <coughs> graph of that trial. In the middle of the graph, you see that there is a dark shaded area. This is actually a hole in the ground, which really shouldn't have happened. It should have been a rise. But this is also this shows the limitations of the distance sensor. Due to the fact that the box was black, it absorbed that light and reflected less light back, which then recalled a lower voltage reading from the distance sensor, which due to our graph created a longer, a deeper hole in the ground instead of a rise. The sharp, uh, the sharp uh, peaks here and here are actually wherever the, the quadrocopter changed direction and you saw that swivel. Uh, this, and this shows the limits of the quadrocopter about whenever it's turning. Figure shown here are the calculated uh, costs in terms of labor, labor and material. And overall, uh, the total projected cost turned out to be about $4,500. And not counting things like the quadcopter or the Galileo, which were uh, given to us uh, at no charge, it would turn out to be about $4,000. And in comparison, we found a company that did exactly what we were trying to do, but with a lot more sophisticated technology and uh, materials and their, their quoted cost for commercial use is about $50,000. So looking over the project, we realized the infrared sensor is was not ideal as a different material such as grass and a color of black or concrete uh, reflect differently with a, in terms of infrared light. So going over a large area with an infrared sensor for surveying it would create a lot of different readings. The GPS longitude and latitude were fairly accurate. Uh, however, the altitude had uh, varied a bit too much for a decent surveying map. The quadcopter, the quadcopter did have a little bit of tilting issues, but overall it was extremely stable and performed very efficiently compared to what we wanted. And we may have went in with the desire to be a cost-effective surveying tool, but uh, we've also shown in a way that uh, going through such a method may hinder uh, the results from the surveying. In order to reproduce our project, we would highly recommend a higher accuracy from the GPS. This would mean a more accurate model, a bigger model, a more precise model. Alternative sensors to spot objects in the ground would also be highly recommended. Anything from a ultrasonic range finder that would that's really good for close distances for a, any kind of autonomous flying. A camera to actually give a, a precise rep representation of the ground to, to see all kinds of different objects on the ground and also a LiDAR system, which is, all, which is similar to ours. It uses a near-infrared light, and, but it's much more powerful, and so it bounces back no matter what, it, what you're looking at. In order to have all these different kinds of sensors, a larger communication port we need, will be needed, and therefore a larger power supply, and of course, more sophisticated programming for any kind of autonomous movement, 
and collecting data from all those types of different sensors would be required. An accelerometer would help with the quadrocopter to, to decrease the swivel, to decrease that, that error there. And like stated before, uh, minimal autonomous flying would help scan an entire area more efficiently instead of just flying in a designated path that a user can, can uh, deviate from. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we would also thank our parents for uh, getting us through all this. And of course, Donna for helping us through all of our all of our trials here. Dr. Steven, our faculty advisor, the whole engineering staff for all the cobos, and of course Jackson Taylor for the quadcopter piloting it for us. Any questions? of your distance sensor, um, I guess it's, it's kind of moot if, if you found it to be not accurate enough, but, but did you, you did one, you showed the results from one trial, did you, did you repeat the calibration at all? Yeah, uh, how calibration was done, <coughs> we set the program up to run on an endless loop, and then that endless loop took the same measurements one to two hundred times, and then we averaged all of those measurements out for one point. So it was. But you only actually physically moved it once. Uh, the we moved it a couple times. Uh, but in terms of one trial. In terms of one trial, yeah, only once okay. because it fitted so well to the data sheet for the the distance sensor. Uh, okay, you left that part off. Okay. <laughs> um, the other question I have is, uh, you say a better a better accuracy in the GPS would uh, would would be your next your next step maybe. Um, what's the comparison of the GPS board you had to the, the GPS surveying equipment that we own uh, here in the department? The is, is, what's, what's the accuracy? Could you, could you just fly around with, with one of the, the GPS surveyors that we have and, and make a really good distance sensor so you could, you could know exactly where you were and then, and then measure the distance to the ground from that point? We don't have any information on USI's uh, GPS system. We didn't uh, think about that specific uh, method. Okay. Uh, however, the distance sensor that we did buy was a low power, almost hobbyist type of distance sensor. It is most, the only trials this type of distance sensors are used for is for um, any kind of Google Earth or, uh, or hobbyist reasons. So the accuracy is already going to be minimalized due to the low cost and the low power consumption of this business of the GPS. Thank you. Yes. So I kind of believe that you can still deal with the low cost. Um, so I like the recommendations that you gave. Um, a question that I had was how would you overcome your settling time issue if you wanted to re retain with a, like I said, with a different GPS, hopefully one about the same cost, but a much more accurate altitude after settling, then yes, overall the project would be greatly improved. But, uh, and if the distance, the infrared sensor is replaced with, say, ultrasonic, you use to fly closer, then that'll solve any issues in terms of uh, various objects. So, and there still seems to be ways to make it cost effective, but it still might do a little tweaking. And for this specific project, uh, how we dealt with the settling time was actually uh, we put in a delay. We simply uh, turned it on, let the, the GPS communicate with the satellites for a little bit before actually starting the test. I didn't know if you guys were taking it in your code, if you were taking an average of that data set that you were collecting, and then I'm putting that <coughs> An average was thought of. Okay. Um, however, we a delay in the measurement taking also allowed for um, instead of taking a measurement ten times a second or twenty times a second, we took a measurement every second to allow the GPS and the distance sensor time to rebound from the previous <coughs> measurement. Any other questions? 
while, while we're on the topic of low cost, I, I didn't notice it in your economic slide. Did you include the cost of the surface generating software? Yes, that okay. software was actually fairly inexpensive. It was only thirty dollars for a ninety day trial. Student trial. Student trial. Okay. How much is it for not 90 days? I think it was a couple thousand for terminal yeah. future distance. Yeah. For yeah. permanent yeah. Yeah. use, yeah. a couple yeah. thousand is the average cost of any of our software here. So if you wanted full time, it would be a bit pricey. Mm -hmm. But it had a, a, a lot more features besides just surface picking up. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In the grid. What did you say the reason for the hole or what you thought it was? The infrared sensor, uh, the black uh, top on that box over there, it absorbed uh, pretty much all the infrared light. So instead of sending back uh, accurate infrared reading for the sensor to detect, it uh, either received no to little reading. So it took it as a 18 feet or longer, uh, I think, like the. Like the graph, it took it as an 18 feet or longer distance, so that's where it created a big dip. And it, the lower voltage it got is represented here. Uh, ah, sorry, the lower voltage represented over here, and that numeric value. And since it's a lower number, it's a a higher distance, so it, it pushed into the it, it pushed into the ground instead of bouncing back as a spike. Could it have any? Um, distance width and actually read it as a negative as it's breaking up in here. Because you showed the, the video of it coming up in that spot and then hovering in where it where it tilted, it spiked. I was just curious if that that's that's where you would think it came from after reviewing of the data that it, it was determined that that's, um, that dip in the ground came at the point in the in that trial where it flew over it the second time. The height differences are actually calculated from the GPS altitude and we subtract the distance sensor, so no matter how high it goes, if the altitude uh, stays accurate and the distance sensor goes up with it, it should be still level no matter how high or low it goes. And then the second question, you showed the budget estimates. You said the one um, company that you contacted was about 50000 Is that on the same scale of area? It, it, it's it's a, a man, it a per the, day? the Sense Fly uh, Corporation is a uh, Swiss company who builds uh, the SimsFly surveying drone. It's actually not a quadcopter. It is a, uh, a single wing flight vehicle, and it uses a camera instead of lasers to be able to uh, <coughs> get a 3D representation of the ground. And it can go over, uh, it can go over about an acre at a time. But it requires a lot more, more sophisticated, like I said, camera, mm -hmm. Software to turn that into a uh, good plot that they made. All right, any other questions? Well, let's give them a hand.